which we know that he has not literally received. But in every way that matters, Dr. Peters has been connected to the civil rights movement, from his associations and his work with Dr. King, to his work as an NAACP state conference president, to his work in Denver as pastor at New Hope Baptist Church, and now pastor emeritus and mentor to young people. That's what I appreciate about Dr. Peters, is the way that he embraces immediately and shares his wisdom and knowledge with young people to create a new generation of leaders. And for that, I think we owe him a round of applause right now before he even says a word. Before he even says a word, I want to make sure that this state conference appropriately thanks him for the work that he has already done. Yes. Yes. You've been very patient and a long day. Got a good leader here, Sister Rosemary. She's doing a fine job. Give her a hand. Um, this is a critical time. And we do need a strong and vibrant NAACP in Boulder. This is this is a critical time. I've been around a long time. I haven't seen any time as critical as this. It is a very critical time. And, and you talk about stories. I got hundreds of them. I may roll out one or two in the uh, midst of the brief presentation I'm going to make, but there are a lot of stories out there in the civil rights movement. You see, to start with, people think that this is a resurgence of the NAACP. What you don't understand really is that the NAACP has been there all the time. Yes. Hmm. Yes. The NAACP is the oldest, strongest, most successful civil right in history organization in history. Way back when W.E.B. Du Bois was debating with Booker T. Washington, differences of opinion but the same goal to do something. So this is not a resurgence. The NAACP has been here all the time but it's going to do some new things in this critical time. It ought to be a good chip, chapter in Boulder because you got a good reputation in Boulder. You're supposed to be <laughs> the people who don't like you call this the Democratic Republic of Boulder. <laughs> and some other names, maybe. I want to thank the young man who did that poetry, who did that. I have a hard time. I'm into popular music, and some of the music that's called hip-hop. I have a problem with the rap because I don't like the bad language. You gave a presentation and didn't degrade women and, and, and say things that were insulting. <laughs> and that's good. Keep it up, brother. Thanks. Keep it up. Thanks. Yes, indeed. Um, but what's Boulder going to do in this crisis? I like the signs outside letting you know that people are welcome, whoever they are. Um, but this has got to be, you're a great people. When I was state president, we had three chapters that had white presidents. It's good to have a black president, but you can have a white president. All through Connecticut, we had, I think, 14 branches. And some of them were in some of those very white communities. Well, white or black, we've got to get the job done and be somebody that's standing up on the issues and taking a, a stand and ready to do the things that need to happen. You're a real sanctuary city. Uh, Denver hasn't caught on yet. They're saying they're not a sanctuary city, but they're talking like it. And the president has promised to cut the money, and he's going to do it. But I'll get to him in a few minutes. <laughs> let, let me share with you just a little bit of my own history. I, I became a member of the youth NAACP when I was 15 years old in Washington, D.C., where I grew up, where black people couldn't go to school with white people. We had two school systems. I don't know if people don't realize that. In the 30s and 40s, I'm old, y'all. <laughs> Back there, Washington, D.C. had two school systems. One for white people and one for black people. 
and couldn't go to movies and you couldn't eat in a restaurant. All of the things that went on in the Deep South went on in Washington, D.C., where I grew up. But I was involved in the NAACP, and I remember sitting on the steps of the Supreme Court in the rain, praying that God would guide the justices because they were ready to decide Brown versus Board of Education. It was decided May 16, 1954, and I was out there as a part of that. And I did a lot of things in the NAACP in Bridgeport, Connecticut, where I was a pastor for a long time. Uh, I was the chair of the housing committee, and we were fighting slum lords. You've heard of slum lords. They had some bad ones in Bridgeport. A dozen children in a two-year period were killed in fires in these slum houses. And I just was the one to confront them. All I did was call these owners of slum properties pimps, and the houses were their prostitutes. Well, they didn't like it, but I didn't care. I was <laughs> saying what needed to be said. Then in 1962, when Dr. King had a, a, a first major uh, march calling people to come in. Now, I, I was a member of the NWCP all the time, but Martin was exciting. Those were some exciting days, folks. And I was on a list of people that they could call. I didn't leave my church and my family, like uh, Andrew Young and, 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 and uh, Walter Fontra and so many others. But I was a list of that vanguard that they could call on when there was something. And Martin called. He said, we need some of you in, in, in uh, Albany, Georgia. I couldn't get any of my friends to go. We had a bus that went from Hartford and some young people went and a couple of ministers there, but I couldn't get any in Bridgeport to go, but we went all the way to Albany, Georgia. Now this was not Freedom Riders. If you know anything about the history of Freedom Riders, the bus were burned and people were beat up and all of those things. We were just trying to get to Albany, Georgia. I never will forget, and this is one of the stories I have so many. When we got to New York, um, we were asked to stop by the core office. And James Farmer came out and got in our bus. And he brought a big sign with him saying, uh, Albany, Georgia, or else, and tied it on our bus. And he got on, and CBS came out, and we rode around the block. And he was making it. He wasn't going now. <laughs> he made a statement. Oh, there are a lot of people that showcase in the civil rights movement. So he was giving an interview of what we were going to do. And as soon as he got off the bus, we went about a mile and took that sign off. We were not trying to be freedom riders. We just had a bus of people trying to get to Albany, Georgia. There's a lot more I could say about that. We learned some things in Albany. People say we didn't win anything. We didn't win any victories, but we learned that you can tie up a city by having a lot of people arrested. You see, when you arrest a lot of people, you gotta feed a lot of people. <laughs> there are a lot of things. Once in Birmingham, I was talking to advising some young people who were on their way to jail, but they didn't go to jail. They took them to the fairgrounds because that was all they had. But we learned something else in Birmingham, that you could really tie up a city to the extent they integrated downtown Birmingham because they were embarrassed of the, the fire hoses and the police dogs and all the things that were going out on television every day. And I was in Birmingham five different times in that, in that period, speaking in 16th Street Baptist Church because I was a spokesman for our group. And that's another long story. I won't get into all of that. But uh, I was the, um, I was looking at, at the Speakers Bureau. I was the head of the Speakers Bureau for the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. I had already been for the NAACP. And I had some very interesting things that happened. I spoke to a group of women, a, a white Middle-aged and senior women's meeting uh, 
uh, in uh, outside of New Haven. Um, and we had a discussion about race relations, just as you've had here today. And one woman said, Reverend, I was hurt. One of them, she meant white people, but you know, one of them broke into the house and I was beat. I thought I would be killed and uh, I survived, but um, I can't get over that. I will never get over, well, she was trying to tell me she'd never get over black people because she had a bad experience with them. And I said to her, I emphasize, well, empathize with what happened to you. It was tragic, I'm sorry. I'm glad you weren't hurt worse. But you're gonna spend the rest of your life hating black people because of that? Tell me something, and don't any of you women, I said, raise your hand, but just think about it. Here's my question. Have you ever been hurt or mistreated or treated very, very badly by a man? And if you did, did you give up on all men? <laughs> think about it. That's one way to look at it, that, yeah, you may have some bad experiences in life, but you, you can't, you know, give up on people and human beings. Um, and I could go on and on. There's so many different. I had a case once, a lady who had been working with us from uh, Darien, Connecticut, if any of you all know Connecticut. And I got a phone call from her right before Christmas. She was desperate, Reverend Peters, I don't know what to do. I said, what's the matter? Her husband was a well-known doctor in that town, said, my daughter is coming home from college and she's bringing a black fella with her and I don't know what to do. My husband is going to have a fit. She said, something about maybe he'll have a stroke. Well, he's a doctor, he ought to know how not to. <laughs> I said, all right, the first thing you need to do is calm down because your husband loves you and he loves his daughter. Maybe he doesn't understand this, but if you gave her permission to bring somebody home, you didn't tell her who it had to be, just you calm down and you know your husband and things will be all right. Call me after Christmas, and she did. And she was surprised that the world didn't come to an end. The world really didn't come to an end. Um, and I've spoken in the last 30 years, more than a thousand times. Uh, I've been in, in Colorado for 30 years. And I've spoken in elementary schools, and middle schools, and high schools, and colleges, all of the colleges around. I spoke at a school this year uh, to a group of uh, children first through third grade. In, in a private school outside of, of Denver. And I had the kids to sing a song. And this was January, Martin Luther King's birthday, which means it was right after Christmas. I said, sing for me, will you, about Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer? And they did, they all knew it. Somebody said, um, when they said, with a very shiny nose, some little girl said, like a light bulb, I hadn't heard that before. <laughs> I said, now, do you think that's a nice story? Well, we don't know. I said, you think it was right that they wouldn't let Rudolph play in any reindeer games because his nose was red? <laughs> and the teacher told me later, I never thought of that before. Well, it was my job to think of it. <laughs> and to get your un people to understand, you've got to treat people right, no matter who they are or what they look like or what kind of nose they have. The story had a happy ending, and I could share that with the kids. Then one foggy Christmas Eve, Santa came to say, Rudolph, with his nose so bright, won't you guide my sleigh tonight? So the person that you wouldn't play with because they didn't look right yeah. may be somebody that can help everything. And I could go on and on with stories, but what I really want to share with you is that Folks, we're in the midst of a major crisis. I've been a student of presidential politics. I grew up in Washington. I used to watch from outside as they went in for these great inaugurations. I served papers 
down, uh, I think it's a Supreme Court building, the cops in the Supreme Court building. And I was looking and watching all of these things. Then, by the grace of God, I had a chance to go when Obama went out. I, I tried to be a delegate the first time, but I didn't know the politics of being a delegate. So in his first campaign, I couldn't get in. He, I got in to the big thing at the stadium. Some of you were there probably? Yes, to the big, uh, when he gave his acceptance speech. But I couldn't be a delegate. But by the next time, I learned the ropes. And I was a delegate to the Democratic National Convention in Charlotte, North Carolina. And we endorsed him, of course, and all of the wonderful things that happened. But, folks, we're in the worst crisis in history. Mm -hmm. We've got a man in the White House who doesn't respect anybody. It's, it's never been this bad. Um, you know, I, I was the head of the state conference of branches when Richard Milhouse Nixon tried to appoint Haydensworth and Coswell yeah. to the Supreme Court. And I would, every one of my speeches, they, did, they liked the way I said Millhouse. I said, we've got to stop Richard Millhouse Nixon. And, 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 and I said all over Connecticut and to Washington and everywhere. And we got it stopped. But it won't be that easy now. We've got a situation like we've never had before. I picked up uh, the post last Tuesday. I read it every day. I read the New York Times. I get it online, and I can read that. I get some better news than I get out of Denver. But I picked up the paper Tuesday, and I found two things that I can put into my speech. One is that they admit that 14 million people will lose their health care by next year. 14 million, and it will be 24 million by 2026. Nobody gets upset, but it's time somebody got upset. Yes. It's time Boulder got upset. You yes. want to be a sanctuary city? Yes. You got to get into this fight. We got to fight. And then the next story said that the federal budget will be reduced by 337 million dollars. Wow. So they're going to take it from the poor people and reduce the taxes of the rich people and fatten the budget and they can boast about it? And this was before the budget came out. Since I wrote this down or jotted it down, the budget came out. And that's the worst budget against everybody poor. Yep. Everybody, they don't even want meals on wheels going out. It's a terrible thing. They cut all of the programs for children, all of the pro. I haven't seen any document like this. I know it won't go through like that, but we've got to fight. When Mr. Trump first got elected, I had a lot of people calling me saying, what do we do now? I said, I don't know. <laughs> Over and over again, I said, I don't know. But that was a couple of months ago. I know now. You know what we've got to do? Fight it every time we get a chance. Go to the town hall meetings, uh, write letters to people, uh, stand up against the evils that are going forth in our country. I'm glad that the courts stopped him on the uh, uh, banning the Muslims the first time. They may stop him this time, I don't know, but everything he tries to do, if we believe in freedom, justice and equality, and caring about people and working for people and causes, now is the time. Every church, every civil rights organization, every chapter of the NAACP, everybody who believes in freedom has just got to stand up and be counted and say something about what's going on because it's not good. Gonna kill Medicaid, me, um, yeah. Medicaid, yes. Hurt everybody. How can we as American citizens sit back and not stand up to it? 
Some people say there's nothing we can do. Yes, it is. Every time there's a point, you need to be there. You need to go to meetings. You need to go to hearings. You get, need to do everything you can possibly do. The Civil Rights Movement was great, no question about it. But a time has come now when we've got to do something that we've never thought of doing. So I want to urge you to stand up. I've been in thousands of NAACP meetings all across the years, but I'm old now. Just a couple of months ago, I turned 84 years old. And I'm some lady, some man has got to take my place. I can't keep this up. Somebody has got to stand up and, and speak to the nation and do the kind of things that I've been blessed to do for all of these years. Because anybody can be the person who is seen as a leader. I want to I wanna close with this. I, um, um, Sam Cooke, can y'all remember Sam yes. Cooke? Yes. Uh, I, I was a fan of popular music and, and going back, when I first came to them, back in the late 60s, Sam Cooke, a great singer whose songs I loved, was shot down by a woman in California and they went to the studios to see what his last song was. And it said something about a change. I was born on a hill, he said, by a river in a little town. Just like that river, I've been running ever since. It's been a long time coming, but I know a change is going to come. Um, Otis Redding got killed in a plane near Chicago on his way to a gig. And his last song was, I left my home in Georgia, heading for the Frisco Bay, because I've got nothing to live for. Looks like nothing's going to come my way. I'm just sitting on the dock of the bay, wasting time. Martin Luther King Jr., when he was getting ready to die, and that night in Memphis, Tennessee, Stood up and said to the people, I, 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 I've been to the mountaintop and I've seen the promised land. May not live to get there with you, but we will as a people get to the promised land. My eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. And so I leave you with that, that there's a fight ahead and there's no time to get ready to die. Somebody's got to live through this thing and see things get better. And I'm convinced that we can do it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.